Hello everyone, Eknoth here. And this is just going to be a bit of a talk, or not quite a review, but not quite an akin to a, it's kind of akin to a review. I've never really done a review before, or anything like it. But this is more, I'd say, an evaluation. But that's what, kind of what a review is. At least from my specific perspective. But that's the point of a personality review, isn't it? Anyway, that's just all irrelevant. As you probably have seen by the title, Final Fantasy XV, something, something, something. Who... <laughs> would that make it? No, that'd, that'd be a terrible title. And one thing I'm glad to say. I enjoyed it. <laughs> That's straight to the point, isn't it? Review's over. I enjoyed it. It's good. It's good. I don't care what other people think. I enjoyed it. And, well, if, you, if you're like me and you enjoyed it and you didn't care what anyone else thought, well, good on you. Now, a lot of people have all these rather interesting thoughts on the game. Some of which I find to be very, very strange. The one that I find strangest in particular is a sort of broad picture thing. The Their view of the, hey, there's the open world bit at the start, for like the first half of the chapters and then there's the linear part for the rest of the game and I think people have a slight misinterpretation of what that actually means because it doesn't actually mean that half the game is linear and half the game is open world because that open world half is a heck of a lot bigger than the linear part that open world part begins somewhere around chapter 8, chapter 9 after you've finished chapter 9, you're on a straight road. And thematically, you really don't want to get off that straight road and explore too much. Like, there's a point where you stop and do some exploration, but beyond that, you're, you've got a destination and you're going. There's a few... Like, there's a few places where um, you stop on this... Wow. Well, you're basically going to the you know what? Spoilers, this this whole whole this whole thing's gonna have spoilers. Just gonna put that out there. If you if you haven't played it or you intend meaning you intend to play it and haven't played it and you don't want to be spoiled stop right here, but no it's it's a pretty good game. There's a there's flaws in it. Definitely. But it's pretty good. It's definitely pretty good. And a lot of it's very fun. So, on to this story. You're going to the enemy's capital city. And you're taking the train, so that's how you're stuck on a line of straight route. And you're, for story purposes, you're very intent on getting to the enemy's city. And it's both a matter of revenge and a matter of um, getting back your crystal. Which is kind of the whole premise. You need the crystal back. But it's during this period that all the other stuff starts to come up. The rest of the, the actual plot. As opposed to... It does the Final Fantasy 2 villains thing. So the first villain... Is the Nephilim Empire. And they're the bad guys because they're doing this, that, and the other. But then you realize somewhere along this way, mostly going when you're on the train, that when you're on this last linear stretch, you sort of realize that the real enemy isn't the Nephilim Empire, it's the encroaching night. The Night that doesn't seem like it's going to end. Because the nights are becoming long, and not just naturally longer, unnaturally so. So it's less and less daylight in the game. No logical sense to that at all, but... Evil. Actually, demons. Which 
are explained in a very sciencey sort of way. Well, very pseudoscience-y. It's explained as it's um, I don't remember if it's pathogen that is that they use to describe it because I can't remember pathogen or virus or something like that. And there's a whole bunch of plot twists involved in that, which is all really fine. But you've got this first bit that's very open, but it's a very you're not in this massive rush. I mean, there's a sort of sense of, hey, we we should kind of get going. But at the same time, it's like, there's no reason for them not to, uh, you know, help make some difference, do some good, because all things considered, they're these powerful warriors who can deal with all these very terrifying monsters that most people really can't. And they can deal with it a lot easier than most people. So, and they kind of also need funds because they they went, they set off as a bunch of broke ass royalty. Well, a broke ass prince, prince of his retinue or entourage of a photographer, a chef, and a survivalist. They're a weird bunch. Um, so, that's just a general saying of. I sort of disagree with a lot of people's complaints about the um, it narrowing down at the end because it's not as long a narrowing, not as long a section of gameplay as people seem to think it is compared to the rest of the game, and it's actually very thematical because um, at that point in the game, Noctis, even if he's being sort of a uh, bit difficult to work with and a bit mopey he's very much intent on his goal it's very very I'm going there I'm doing that I'm ending this shit I'm getting revenge because it's not just about insomnia anymore it's more it's even more personal than it was before I mean, if I remember Kingsglaive correctly, Noctis never got the chance to have revenge on the guy who killed his father. Um, Nix. N Nix Ulrich. I think that's it. Nix Ulrich? No. I'm thinking Edward Ulrich. Uh, it doesn't matter. Nix got... Nix managed... I think I think Nix managed to kill the guy who killed um, Reg Regis. King Regis. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Nix managed to kill him. Yeah, Nick's together with um, his dipshit buddy and Luna. Together they managed to kill that guy after Nick's got him, killed himself by using the ring of Lucius. Still, Nick's was a badass in that movie. That doesn't really matter too much though. Anyway, Kingsglaive is a fine setup for it. People say you don't really know what's going on without Kingslave, and there's a bunch of stuff that happens off screen, and there is, but with one of the more recent patches, they include a few scenes from Kingslave that make it pretty clear what's gone on, and a few scenes from Omen, the Omen trailer, which are like, hmm. Although, speaking of the Omen trailer, the, there's. The Omen trailer implies a slight, some slight differences that could have happened in the story, especially with how um, gun weapons are handled, because there is a certain weapon in the game that indicates that they were cons probably considering using having guns work a little differently when they were initially um, making the game, because you can find a sniper rifle called Cerberus. Or Cerebrus, or however you want to pronounce it. I personally, personally say Cerberus. Not Caribbeus, but hey. Anyway, and this sniper rifle, the only gun that's a sniper rifle. Machines are different, they're a whole different ball game. 
and they're actually fairly interesting. But the, the sniper rifle, let's get back to it. It's the longest range weapon in the game. Okay, so that's cool. And what does it do exactly? Well, it allows you to aim it. This is different from any other weapon. No, no other weapon do you aim. You focus the target and you attack it. Guns shoot automatically at the target, so yeah. Well, other than magic, which you can aim, but most of the time, I wouldn't even recommend aiming with magic. It's easier to just, um, especially if you're using weight mode, just go into weight mode, switch targets, and throw it. If you're not using weight mode, you can just either lock onto your target or get a lock onto your target, so to speak, and just press the button and it throws it. It's a lot quicker and a lot easier than trying to aim manually. And generally speaking, with a clump of enemies, just hitting one of them is good enough. And really, <laughs> magic is very rarely actually needed. Um, there's a few particular enemies that I would recommend it for. Ooh, that is, and that brings me to another point that I have again. One point that really bugs me. So, you can break the damage cap. Okay, there's, there's ways to do it. However, breaking the damage cap gives you a second damage cap. Instead of quad nines, it's quint nines, as in five nines. Yeah. And, as you can imagine, thinking, hey, I'm going to make this super awesome spell that breaks damage cap and can do a shit ton of damage. It'll be awesome. And then to only ever do Quint 9, it's like, damn. Damn, it could have been so much better. But these are the minor gripes that I'm mentioning. These are minor technical details that could have been, you know, just slightly better. Could have been slightly cooler. Let you pull off more. Let you actually feel more powerful. And honestly, against most enemies, that Quint 9's will do the trick. There's like a few enemies in the game that that won't outright kill. Well, or at least until you're dealing with the very end gamey stuff. Now, okay, let's talk about I've been talking about how there's some I was talking about how the guns may have been intended to play differently and stuff like that. Um so let's talk about the combat in the game. This is a good place to start. The combat is fairly simple. You have four weapon slots on your character on Noctis. Each of your um, companions has two weapon slots, and their two weapon slots is their primary weapon, which is always for um, Gladio. It's a great sword. For Ignis, it's a pair of daggers, and for Prompto, it's a gun. Then they have a secondary slot, which can either be a specific weapon to each of them or magic so honestly I use specific weapon because I like to be able to use um, special abilities that they have which is part of the combat so Gladio has what this Gla has shields yep um, Ignis has spears and Prompto has machines which is kind of interesting because Prompto is the only character other than Noctis who can use machines which are Okay, there's, there's like four or five different machines, and they all behave very differently. Because machines are an oddity in this. Okay, So normally, you can lock on with um, the right bumper, and press triangle. And this will make you do a warp strike. Just pressing triangle in battle will make you warp. And sometimes out of battle, you can use triangle to just warp if you don't feel like running. But this, there's areas that you can and areas that you can't. But, with machines, it's different. Instead of warp striking, do, pressing the triangle button will allow you to perform the special move of the um, machine. One of them's like a saw blade that goes, that smash, that cuts things nearby. One of them shoots out poison all around you, which is kind of handy. That's the one that I've left on prompto the whole time. Um, then there's one that um, 
produces a sort of black hole gravity effect, which does more of the... Um, I'll describe it more like um, Kingdom Hearts magnets bells than... Uh, which I think is mostly common, more found in um, Birth by Sleep than anything else. But it's more like the, the magnet spell than, say, Demi. And that draws enemies in. There's one that shoots crossbow bolts, so that one's pretty cool. Not exactly the most useful, but it's kind of cool. And the last one's a drill, which just deals a lot of damage, if, if it hits. So, that's a bunch of cool stuff there. So those are very unique. The rest, it's like... You throw the sword, you warp to them, and you deal damage. You throw the great sword, you warp to them, you deal damage. You throw the daggers, you warp to them, you deal damage. Spear is the same. Um, shield's the same. Gun, your yeah, gun's the same, except you um, teleport, you're up, and you shoot up at them. Like you're sort of kneeling and you shoot up a bunch of them, and it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah. So there's that. That's that's fairly cool. And so the basic combat, it's fairly simple. Um, dodging, there's basically two variants on it. You can either roll away, or you can just hold down the dodge button, which makes you um, basically um, phase through attacks, so you don't take damage. There is a there are some conditions where that doesn't quite happen, um, and those are kind. And though one of those is late game, one of those can be fairly early game. Um, I don't know. I never really used actual shields with Noctis, and there's a reason for that. And that brings us to the big other aspect. Well, no, let's actually talk about um, all the other characters' um, special ability moves. Actually, before we get to that. Let's talk about Blindside and Links. So you can, if you coordinate your attacks with your allies, which isn't really easy, but it just happens a bunch. And also, if you attack the enemy from behind, you'll deal um, boosted damage. I think there's my, I don't know about crit chance on that, but it could be higher. But it doesn't matter. Because you're getting this boosted damage, and it's cool. It's good. And you do these combo moves, which are pretty cool. And then... that That's a pretty cool thing. And you can boost a bunch of this stuff with, um, um, through Ascension, which we'll get to later. But the, but the main premise is that... You can do a bunch of stuff with your allies. And your allies, you can actually... The thing is... This has a lot of similarities to old um, Final Fantasy games. And it's not for just... Be and it's less... And you actually have a fair bit of control over your party members. That's what I'm trying to get at here. You have a fair bit of control. Which makes... Which should make summoning easy, but it's... can be a bloody nightmare if you actually want to summon something. <laughs> you can force a summon, but we'll, we'll get the summons in a bit. I should just stick to the track that I'm on. Okay, so there's a free part tick gauge. Tick bar. It's got three parts to it. One part will allow you to do a level one um, technique from one of your partners. Two for a level two, three for a level three. Honestly, um, the level one ones can be just as good as the level two or the level three ones. I only ever, I've only ever used one of the level 3 ones, so... And, disappointingly, well, actually I've used two because, um... I'll get into, because there's a guest party member that uses, that has a free bar move. But anyway, um... What generally happens with these techniques is, one of your characters will perform an action... It'll deal damage. A uh, say we'll, we'll just mention Prompto's initial one, Piercer. He shoots. It deals damage to a single target, or actually, it doesn't deal damage to a single target. It deals damage to enemies in a line. And then it's then it's you, and you can 
then there will be a prompt for the circle button. You press it. If this, this is if we're on PlayStation, remember? You press it because I just remember that it's on Xbox One, which I'm like, I forget it. I forget the Xbox One exists sometimes. <laughs> really, that's kind of sad. But that's beside the point. Um, you press the button and you deal a little bit of extra damage on top of what they dealt. More specifically, to the to the target of the attack. And everyone has moves like this. But they also have other weirder ones as well, like, um... Prompto has one that can be used... I don't know how effectively it, effective it is at building AP, but it does help build AP. Which is ascension points which boost your... which allows you to upgrade your characters. Um... Gladio has one that allows you to just smack down on the enemies. Prompto has one, another one which lets you um, draw an enemies to a certain point. Um, Ignis has a couple of cool ones. One which allows you to enchant Nox weapon with the most elementally effective element against the enemy, so that's cool. But not always the most helpful. Anyway, ignoring all that, because we should ignore all that for a second, they have, it lets you make use of your companions, except in certain fights where it's like, nah, they're not in range, they're not in range, they're not in range, they're never in range, they'll never be in range. This isn't going to work, you know, you can't use these abilities. Oh, you can use Prompto Snapshot, but nothing else. And stuff like that sometimes happens, but... Or, oh, you just use Fundriga. Everyone's on the floor, um, writhing in pain. Whoops. That is a thing to note about the magic. So let's go back to the magic for a second. The magic, or at least the combat magic early on in the game, consists of free spells. Well, if you don't count warping and phasing as spells, which I kind of do, but let's say we just count these free spells. You got fire, lightning, thunder, which is lightning, and ice. That's it. You got those, you got their fire, 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 like same with the water. Um, you technically have um, freeze, um, I think it's shock and flare, which are their damage cap breaking variations. Which have another damage cap on top of them, which kind of sucks, but beside the point. Um, and so, generally how this, how this magic works is, you craft it out of energy and items that you choose to use. And these items give modifiers, sometimes. Sometimes they don't give modifiers at all, which can be kind of disappointing, but they do give modifiers. And, like, for instance, there is the heal cast modifier, the kill cast modifier, the um, Xperia cast modifier, the dual, tri, quad, and quint cast modifiers, which are your best shot at actually dealing, increasing the damage that your spell does until you get the, um, until you get the, um, um, break damage limit modifier which um, only that's like real end that's end gamey stuff and if you want to use it effectively you're gonna to have to grind a bit although not really I mean I just did that for um, spell count but the problem is the damage cap makes it not all that great Okay, so that's all fine and good, and we've reached the point where we're like, okay, we've we can take on, we've got all these abilities, we can do these things. Sadly, we don't have any interesting stuff like float or earthquake or quake or tornado or area or cure or or anything like that. We don't have any of those sorts of magics. So, and the thing about these magics is that they have an area of effect that can harm you as well. So if you catch your allies in the spell, the spell's not going to damage them initially, but the after effect's going to affect them. Well, unless you're using blast casts, which is a bad idea, and 
just just don't do it just don't anyway um so this um, method of spellcasting and the worst it has a different effect each time for instance for each spell fire um, it will set characters on fire which will do gradual damage lightning will create an area where people are take damage and it's quite severe and ice is probably the most annoying but least damaging it uh, I think it slows down enemies and allies as well but it creates a whole like blizzard effect so you, or at least powerful versions of it do so you can't see anything and it's annoying as all hell especially fighting this one of the well I wouldn't call it a super boss I'd say it's a a eh, bit of a drag boss takes a while to beat that's all it is it's not difficult that's what a super boss is supposed to be difficult not just long-winded anyway on to so that's the general combat system now the combat system expands a bit as you go along in the game because firstly you open up new accessory slots which is handy that's part of your gear um, each character can have the free accessory slots but unlocking the free accessory slot is a ridiculous pain in the ass so yeah don't really be too concerned about that anyway so you've unlocked all your accessory slots no you haven't so you've unlocked two on each character because you can have up to three but two is easy so you can put on accessories that helps um, different outfits most of which you get end gamey um, have different effects and there's well the different outfits are end gamey or if you've bought um, if you bought the season pass and all that jazz and pre-orders you get another outfit but that's not really all that important the main one that you'll probably have if you buy later is um, you there'll be four outfits that are available there's the um, whatever you're wearing, the princely clothes or whatever, with and without jacket, and casual clothes with and without jacket. Without the jacket, you have higher offense, but with the jacket, you have higher defense. I personally favor without the jacket. Not to mention I prefer Noctis look, how Noctis looks without the jacket, but personal preference aside, this doesn't have that big an impact. This act actually, uh, re re roll that back and say, this actually does have a fairly big impact as being able to deal damage is actually very helpful of course being defensive is also helpful and it's a bit of a mixed thing so and all the other characters have the same effective four outfits except not prince so for like prompto i'd recommend keep him with the jacket on because otherwise he'll just take too much damage and other stuff like that that's beside the point I keep saying that's beside the point. It's kind of the point. Um, and in that respect, all the other characters, all the characters are built very differently. So Prompto is the most fragile, while Gladio is the most powerful. Um, with Ignis and um, Noctis sort of lying between the two. With, I'd say Ignis sort of fills a more support role than. Noctis who supports a more front line -y role, but not quite, I'm going to take all the hits like Gladio. Or Gladio, so I have not, I think it's Gladio. I forget sometimes how it's pronounced. Anyway, so we've gone through the basics of the combat, and it's fairly fun. The one thing I would say is, um, I wish I could cancel out of the attack animation with, a, with um, a phasing or a dodge because there's times where I'm like I press the dodge button but I was in the middle of attack animation so I got hit can't do anything about it now apparently so it's a game where you're committed to your attacks and dodging has not exactly the most purpose there is a um, time later in the game where I dodged because it was easier than the other method I had at hand and that's a that's um there's a chapter four chapter thirteen thing yes chapter thirteen thing that I, that that was about 
No, that's not really important. We're going to talk more about what you kind what you kind of do in the game. So there's essentially a few things. There's a, essentially a bunch of different storylines in the game. Like most of them are really small, unimportant things, really. There's helping this one woman out with her science, all her science stuff. There's helping. Um, there's doing stuff for Sydney to um, fit out the regalia, which is your car, which you go around in. There's helping out with the um, chocobo, which gets you more um, greens for your chocobo to. Okay. Chocobo. That's a thing. Chocobo are a thing. Chocobo have been a thing for a long time now. Since Final Fantasy 3, I think. Yeah, at least. I don't think they were in 2. No, they weren't in 2. Since Final Fantasy 3, Chocobo have been a thing. And they've been depicted very differently from game to game with... Um, they, they've they been able to co cover amazing amounts of distances. Some instances even walk over water or mountains or anything like that. You've had Final Fantasy 7's amazing racing Chocobo, which... I can't remember how fast they run, but Golden Chocobo in that game can run faster than most cars, I think. And then you have, if you want other amazing Chocobo, look at um, Final Fantasy Type-0, where they are brutal, murderous creatures that will kill, that if trained correctly, will kill legions of soldiers. You'll also kill legions of soldiers, but that's beside the point. You're a magical human guy. Group of 13. But that's beside the point. That that That's other games. Chocobo in um, Final Fantasy XV are pretty cool. You can summon them anywhere as long as you've got them hired. You have to keep them hired for a maximum amount of time of 7 days. But it's really easy to just... Oh, when you're running low on days, just go re rehire... Um, your Chocobo, you can you can customize the ones that you've hired. You can customize their color, their name, or at least the one that Noctis rides, and also put um, ribbons on them, on that one. One from Chocobo Races, which are actually really easy, and really easy to make easy, because um, one of the things you can get, one of the greens boosts stamina, another boosts speed, and another boosts... Um, gliding, or I think it might be speeding, I can't remember if it's a combination, but something like that, and there's one that boosts all of them. If you get the one that boosts speed, you can win the Chocobo races really easily, like no difficulty at all. And that just makes that simple. Um, so that's kind of cool, that's a thing, but it's not really all that important. If you want my opinion on it, but that that's just my opinion. Um, so, and so I'm gonna say there's just a bunch of side quests that are a lot that make you have to do a bunch of different things. Lot there, and there is in particular there just as a very core feature. Uh, well, it's as a core side quest is the hunts, which honestly I gotta say are uh, disappointing when compared to Final Fantasy XII's hunts. As far as something like that goes, uh, Monster Hunting Guild and all that stuff like that, Final Fantasy XII does it amazingly. It's not just fight, hunt, hey go hunt these generic enemies, because that's kind of what um, the hunts in Final Fantasy XV are. There's very few unique hunts. Like, there's um, a few enemies that are very unique to hunts, like you can't actually fight a Caltropos, a Caltropos outside, um, outside of a hunt. And that that's a big, long-necked, really tall creature. So you can't fight that outside a hunt. Um, I think you can only fight a couple of behemoths outside of hunts, and they're very story quest-specific. So, and there's one that you can fight in a hunt. So, okay. Well, there might be two that you can fight. I, no, there's two that you can fight in hunts. One that you... There's an ordinary behemoth. One's a more powerful. I haven't fought the more powerful one. 
so there's a few very um, unique enemies that you can fight in hunts, and there's a few enemies that are bosses that if you want to fight again, you have to take on a hunt or retake on a hunt. And so, honestly, while well, here's the thing, uh, in Final Fantasy XII, hunts were amazing. They were challenges of your skill, your coordination, your preparation, what you knew to do, how how you were willing to do it, your tactics, your ability to adapt on the fly in case it wasn't what you were expecting, all that sort of stuff. Final Fantasy XV, the hunts are kind of generic, but that's that's okay. That's okay. It's not it's not a terrible system. It's not a and it's not terribly grindy either. So then there's a bunch of other side quests and side quest chains, which some of them are really have really fun stories and some of them are just like, yeah, you know. But a note is that these are actually these help encourage exploration of the world and taking you to important places. Specifically, a lot of them lead to dungeons. And that's a very important thing, because dungeons are a big... Well, they're not... They're very important places in the game. So there's a few dungeons. And these are some of the most significant points in the game. One of them is ridiculously tough. Well, I say that because I it's basically the toughest dungeon before post game. There's a post game dungeon, I haven't got into it yet. I know it exists. Um, it's if I'm if I'm guessing right, it's in this really awkward place that's really a pain in the ass to get to that I mean, if you get there you're good. You're good. If you if you screw it up, game over. Actually, it's, it is game over, because that's a um, piece of post-game content that's interesting, to say the least. Not necessarily helpful. Um, there, there's honest, there honestly could have been a better way to go about it if, the, if it, this was all it was going to be used for. Anyway, so these dungeons. The first dungeon that you're going to come across is probably... The one that the story tells you to go to. Or you might, and this is a bad idea if you do, come across a much, much more difficult dungeon. Now, I say much more difficult dungeon, but there's only one difficult enemy in it. The rest of the enemies are like level 5 to 10. Something like that. Bunch of imps. It's like, oh, this isn't. These guys are a nuisance. These guys are a nuisance, and this is, and it's a multi-level dungeon. It's, you know, you've got to explore, find your way around. And this one that I'm talking about isn't a particularly complex one. But what it does throw at you is, it lures you into this false sense of security. Oh, I, I can take this dungeon on. Oh, there's a level 51 enemy in here that will one-shot me. Well, I'm out. I'm, I only ran into that. I only actually realized that dungeon existed because I looked at because I was like, "Where's this one thing that I'm looking for?" And I looked it up. So, guilty me. I looked something up. Whoop de doo. And so there's a dungeon that's very uh, difficult, to say the least. There. Well, at least the boss of that dungeon is difficult, until you're a higher level where. When I actually went to deal with it, I dealt with a whole bunch of that enemy before, so yeah, no big deal there. Um, this is just getting into a rant. The thing I have to say about the dungeons is they're really well designed. They're designed to make you have to explore them. They make you want to look around to find all the stuff in them. That, like, oh, I, I don't just want to go on. I want to see what I can find all the treasures, all the loot, and honestly, some of it's really good. Especially when you hit into a level 55 dungeon at level 34. Unimportant detail. 
But that in of itself is an interesting thing. You could take these dungeons on. Once you gain once you gain access to them, you can take them on. Um, there's only two. Uh, some of them are restricted by story, but it's not that that much story. Um, a little bit of story and okay, there's. I'd say there's actually only three, maybe four areas. I think I think there's only three areas like that the map is divided into into the game in the game. The first area, the second area, and the final small area. There might be like the uh, side of the map that's like own. It might the final area that I was saying might just be. There might be an area that you have to unlock before that, but and there's. There's periodical um, locking down. You can't go this way or that way throughout the game, but at the end you can go everywhere, of course. And that's oh, that's that's um, very story related. But there's dungeons in each of these places that you could take on theoretically at very low levels, or if you do, there's a certain, or if you do a certain tr um, thing which involves either not sleeping or using the experience armband or whatever it is, which you get um, with the day one edition and the travel pack DLC. Eh. You and or it might just be one of the updates, one of the free DLC um, updates that gives you this. Yeah, the dungeons are actually really good. They encourage exploration. There's uh, there's actually stuff to do in them. Like, oh, there's this task you need to do in here. And a few things like that. There's certain enemies in them that you won't find elsewhere. They're, like, one of them is really challenging. Another one's fairly challenging. And so on and so forth. And you can find very u some of the mo unique and most powerful monsters in the games in them. There's also a bit of mystery to them because you find things that you can't deal with, you can't interact with yet, which is cool. But the main reason that you want to go into a lot of these dungeons is because they contain a royal tomb. Now this is a story element that's kind of important because Noctis can become more powerful by acquiring these special weapons. These are the weapons of his ancestors stored in their royal tombs. And there are 13 in total. And I could list off exactly what they are, but I won't. But his, these weapons are very unique. And too many of them are swords. But that's beside the point. Besides the fact that too many of them are swords, they are very unique, as I've said. Um, and they all play differently from standard weapons. So, sure, you've got the swords. The, the short swords play like short swords. And there's a couple of broad... There's a broad sword, big sword, that plays like a big sword. But then there's other weapons that play similar, but not quite the same. And there are some that I don't really use. But... The thing that I use these weapons most commonly for is not the fight with them. No, because these weapons, the thing about these weapons that they're best at is giving you stat boosts. There's one that gives you great, a, quite a nice increase in damage in exchange for some defense. There's one that gives you quite a nice, uh, actually a tremendous boost to defense, but it saps a whole bunch of your strength. You can still use magic, though. And then there's one that boosts your magic. And then there's others that um, boost elemental defenses and stuff like that. One takes away from elemental defenses, but can deal some pretty awesome damage in certain ways. And the un most unique thing about all of these weapons is how they use Warp Strike. When they warp strike, they behave completely differently from any other weapon. Most weapons have a very standard, you go at them, you hit them. Um, one of the most, one of the best examples is, there's a longsword. 
okay, there's there's going to be a longsword, a big two-handed sword. Uh, well, fantasy longsword, I say. Not with uh, ignoring how fantasy uses the word longsword, but it's a big sword, okay, and. What it does is instead of just warping straight to the enemy, which you do do, you do warp to the enemy, it starts off by when you go into the warp, you pull the sword back, and it shoots off a bunch of beams of light. Which kind of reminds me of one of um, uh, Cecil's um, moves in Dissidia, but that's beside the point. But it, that actually brings me to another point about these weapons. They're all unique and they all behave differently when you do this. With one of them being very special in how it does stuff. But the thing that they all do in common... Which I kind of find disappointing that they all do this. And not just some of them. And others have um, other, you know, costs or effects is that they all drain your HP to use. So, they're very Dark Knight weapons. The Dark Knight class. However, sadly, they lose their edge towards the end of the game. They're more powerful than basically anything else in the game, but... the um, there's a, a lot of your weapons are becoming comparable. Or at least sort of comparable. Not 100%, but they have advantages over this, these weapons, and these weapons don't actually classify as any of the weapon types. So they're not going to gain benefits from this enemy being weak to great swords or ordinary swords. They all, however, do light damage, which if I, I believe they all do light damage. So that's one benefit you have, because a lot of enemies are weak to light. Which is explained in the story, because a lot of them are demons which will die very quickly in daylight. Which is why they only come out at night. The, the real demon said it's not just wild creatures, which are still dangerous. Anyway. So these whip... Oh, that probably explains that as well. There's a story detail that I just realized that I'm like, oh, that probably explains why they deal so much damage to those enemies. And that's just, and that the most important thing about these weapons is they have these unique um, warp strikes, and then there's something else: your ultimate ability, the armiger, or well, sort of ultimate ability. It it's, it is your ultimate ability. It's just it's amped up in certain parts of the game to be ridiculous, and I do mean like. This is awesome. I have, I no longer care if the story makes any sense as long as I get to do this. It's sort of ridiculous. Um, the armor gear is basically the ability to summon all these weapons. They protect you. That's also a note. Um, if you're under gunfire and you use your um, phase, you, and you have some of the royal arms, you will be. Uh, They'll basically shield you from the damn it, from the bullets. Anyway, anyway, um, the armor gear summons all the weapons that you have at the time, and it allows you to launch a barrage of attacks. Like, you just keep mashing the attack button. You're not gonna take. You can't. I'm pretty sure you can't be killed while you have this going, and you can deal massive damage to enemies. As a matter of fact, I found that it one shots. Um, a very powerful enemy that I was like, this is going to be a fun, kind of difficult fight. Except I found out that that enemy is really fragile, so it's... No, it's not a fun, very difficult fight. It's a very easy, very easy fight. But that's beside the point. Just because that enemy is easy doesn't mean that it's... not worth your time to even consider doing it. But it's very easy. And kind of disappointing. Um... Anyway, it allows you to deal a huge amount of damage, and the more of the royal arms you gather, the more powerful it becomes. And it plays a big part story-wise. So I've sort of said my piece on um, 
a lot of the open world, the dungeons, um, the general layout of the story. Um, I haven't really talked combat, of course, magic, which is a little disappointing. There's, a, there's some deals of magic that we'll get into in a bit. And that's... And chocobos, of course, and side quests. The thing about a lot of the side quests is a bunch of them don't really fit into the story all that well. And it's just like, why am I doing this again? And just because I felt like helping these people out. I'm too nice for my own good. Though it does, ha does help me find things. Anyway, and the main story elements are... Or at least to start with is finding the royal tombs and all that jazz. But... We can move on from that. Because, well, that's all cool and stuff. It's not the most important. Well, it's all very important, to be honest. It's all important, but... I'm getting sidetracked from continuing with this. The world is fairly big. And... It... Could be travelled on foot. And it wouldn't take... Ridiculously long. It would just take quite a while. You don't. You wouldn't want to walk. You wouldn't want to walk across the world. You wouldn't really want to run across it either. So, f and fast travel is helpful. However, there's a limitation to fast travel. Fast travel. You can only fast travel to places on the road, and specifically, parking spots or outposts. That's where you can fast travel to, and that's fine because there's a lot of these places and. These are places where you want to go a lot, um, pick up side quests, um, um, pick up hunts, buy items, get food, rest, gain experience, because you're rested at a place that gives you, gives you more than a times one multiplier, which is handy when you're trying to level up. Take advantage of that times two multiplier that exists in one place, um, Golden Quay. Uh, that's basic. Yeah, I think it's Golden Quay. Yeah. Anyway, um, and get stat boosting meals, which are very handy, and make things a lot easier. Cause if you're not dealing a lot of damage, it's kind of like, oh god, I wish I had that extra. Like, you can. Work, it's quite handy to early game to have like an extra thirty damage, and that's a lot early game. Extra thirty attack, not damage. End game, you're getting up to like extra 400 damage. That's and that's making a real sig not damage attack. I keep saying damage, An extra 400 attack, and that's making a big difference. That's like, yeah, I'm wrecking you now. Sort of um, increases in damage. So because fights can be quite tiresome if you don't have boosts like that. Um, and you can get some really cool ones and really useful ones like um, Endurance, which allows you to run infinitely without having to... You can run infinitely without trouble, but you have to time a button press, and that's a nuisance at times. There's a particular dungeon where that's a nuisance. But there's also a guy who serves a meal near it that gives you Endurance, which is why I mentioned it in the first place. So, other than dungeons, and the thing about the open world is it's, I would say there's, um, it's nice to travel occasionally, but I would, the thing is you, it's kind of favorable to use the fast travel a fair bit, and between fast travel, I often favored just summoning a chocobo, and running off to my destination. And if you want to fast travel from there, it requires that you go, hey, I got a fa I got a I can fast travel back to the car, and I can fast travel using the car. Which is which is kind of annoying. But Chocobo are good for getting around everywhere that there isn't a road. Or isn't a dungeon. At a dungeon you need to go in on foot. And honestly, Chocobos also help you just not have to deal with encounters as much. Which kind of late game you're like, nah, I really don't feel like fighting these level 12 um, saber tusks or whatever, or 
You know what the imp the Nephilim Empire sent the um Magitek troopers after me again? I really don't feel like dealing with them. They're kind of a nuisance and a non threat, but I don't want to fight them. Because even though they're not a difficult, I still have to hit every one of them to bring them down, so I'd rather not. Which is one that's one of the annoying things, but kind of realistic things about the whole thing. Is they never stop sending magic tech troopers after you. I mean, technically they'd they'd reach a point where they couldn't actually send any more. But that gets into a bit of um story stuff and it'd be like Oh, so that's where all the magic tech troopers come from. And that's why they can't keep producing them infinitely. Oh. And that's what's actually going on. And that's why everyone's screwed. Um, yeah. So, I think... Am I at a point where I should talk about story now? Or characters? Nah, let's talk about the story a bit. The story and characters, okay. So, start of the story, you're setting off, you're go your plane is knocked. You're with Ignis, Gladio, and Prompto. And your goal is you're going to your wedding. You're going to marry Lady Luna Freya, the Oracle, who um, Noct knew as a child. Um, I can't remember how old Noctis is. I'd say he's about 20? Maybe? Because, and that would... And they haven't seen each other in 12 years, if I recall correctly, so that made him about 8. If he's 18, it, he was like 6 at the time. But he, he was young when they met, and they've been in communication ever since. They haven't seen each other, but they've been writing to each other with a dog. Very strange method of communication, but their dog travels great distances with ease. I think he may be part chocobo if they had to mention traveling stuff. I probably haven't put up a video about chocobos and their amazing abilities that make no goddamn sense. Hmm, yeah. I was thinking chocobos being awesome dimension hopping monsters. Dangerous, dangerous creatures. Very dangerous. Um, what? They've been communicated. And so you're setting off to this wedding. First thing that happens, your car breaks down. Well, shit. We gotta get, we gotta get that repaired. You get it repaired. It's like, okay, back to going on to the wedding. You know, you do a bit of, you know, it's a game, so you do a bit of stuff around, do some side quests, you know, make some money. You know, it's, you know, it's not going to just be. You get to the wed, you get to, you go to the wedding, it's all sweet. We're getting married, get hitched in the game. No, that's not going to happen. It's a big RPG. And if you've come in with... And if you've come into the game without any premise of that at all, you're in for a shock. Because, oh no, something goes wrong. And you... the boat, There's no boats to the island where you're going to get married. So, well, that's not great. So, what now? Well, let's, um... Let's let's just let's just rest the night. Let's um let's just take a nap. So we take a nap. And then we get some bad news. Insomnia, our home city, has been attacked. Shit's gone wrong and the king is supposedly dead. So we gotta find out if this is true. So you head upwards and you find out, yeah, shit's gone down. You get called by a guy who summons you to the royal tomb. Sort of. He tells you to come meet him. He's at this place. And you get told by people who are part of... Um, the essentially secret service. That, hey, he's at this he's at the royal, this royal tomb. Go there, meet him. He wants to talk. You go there, you acquire your first royal arm. So... And the story kicks off from there. There's a bunch of stuff, um, and your main goal at this point is to eventually find a way to get um, to this island, um, Altitia. Well, the island's not Altitia, but the city is Altitia. You're trying to get to the city on this island, but you have no way to get there. 
um, you and there's a bunch of roadblocks, so that's a bit difficult. So you got to get through the roadblocks, um, do a few things on the way, and along the way you acquire. You're also getting involved in gaining powers from the god, gifts from the gods, which is basically the ability to summon them, which can be kind of awkward. Summoning. Okay, just so you know, I summoned all but I've summoned all but one summon, and here's the first summon you get. Titan. I never summoned Titan the whole time I was playing Final Fantasy 15. Simply because you get Ramu a heck of a lot, a short time after, and he's a lot easier to summon. Titan, believe it or not, the requirements to summon Titan is the rest of your party members going down. Now, it's like, okay, that shouldn't be too hard. Other characters going down all, is it? other characters go down all the time but the thing is Gladio I just had to make I just had to do everything I could to make Gladio durable and he wound up being too durable he never went down in combat it was the worst he was invulnerable well that's not actually accurate but you know and the further I got into the game, the more difficult it was for me to have my party members die. I could put myself into a critical condition which would aid in summoning another summon, but die? Nah. Nah, you can't get the other characters to die? Nah, that's a nightmare. That's like high level effort stuff. You gotta really, really try to get them to die, and. Have you found something powerful enough to kill them? Nope. 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 Not powerful enough to kill them. Not powerful enough to kill them. <laughs> oh, you want to find something powerful enough to kill them? Go into a dungeon. Crap. Everything. But in a dungeon, you can't summon Titan. So, I could never summon Titan. In all honesty, most of the summons do essentially the same thing. They deal a big burst of damage. And for most things, it will screen wipe. Big bosses on the other hand will survive. They'll take a lot of damage but they'll survive. And that's essentially how um, the game handles summons. It's, a, it's essentially a screen wipe which requires very specific conditions to be put into effect which is very difficult to do. Reliably it's but when it happens, you you can take advantage of it. Um, it helped a lot with taking care of a certain dungeon, which was very difficult. At level 34, that is, when you're fighting a level 55 dungeon. Anyway, that's just saying that's a difficult that that's a difficult dungeon. And I use summons a little too. I use Ramu, who can hit inside dungeons a little too liberally. Um. Yeah. Also, Leviathan, who's the third summon you get after Ramu, can only be summoned near water. So, there's a whole bunch of area that's not near water, so chances of summoning Leviathan are pretty low. The one you'll probably wind up summoning the most after you complete the game is Shiva. Because, oh, any condition can summon, can cause you to summon Shiva. Any of the other other um, summons conditions can cause you to summon Shiva. And that's that. But, anyway. The, in the story, you're basically... Oh yeah, um, we need to be able to... We need to do these things. Get um, Ramu and Titan. Um, we need to be able to get to where we're going... Okay, we, then you get there and you're like, okay, we could, we've got a problem. We need to fix up the boat that we have. So you have to go get some mithril. You go get the mithril. Um, along the way, you've taken out a few bases and stuff. There's uh, not, it's not really all that. There's interesting stuff, but it's not all that interesting yet. Um, so you go and you. Um, take care of some business. 
you work with certain individuals from the Empire to uh, for some re who are, for some reason are helping you. You don't understand the guy that's helping you's intentions. He's a bit of a weirdo, and you don't like him. He's he's not a very likable guy. He's just plain mean. Well, he's not mean, but he's just plain annoying. There's just something off about him, and that's something that was done very well. That he's just off-putting, but you need him. A bunch. So you get the mithril, you get it forged, and a bunch of stuff happens. Um, that's tackling another dun. That's tackling a dungeon. Like, um, there's one, two. I think. I think there's only three story required dungeons. Exclude. No, there's. Well, if you, there's only like three story required dungeons that aren't on the linear path. I think. Yeah, I think there's only three story required dungeons that aren't on the linear path. Anyway, so you do this, you get the mithril, you, then you have to get it forged, and that's a small bit. It's like, oh, that's a really short chapter. Because some of the chapters are like, hey, here's a whole bunch of stuff. And other chapters are like, hey, oh, you're done. And you're like, that was it? And that was it. Now, they're not all like that. They're not all that easy or that quick or that short or and that's when you get into the you go into Altitia and that's where shit starts to go down that's where politics come into it um you make a deal with a politician then the whole Nephilim Empire is trying to sort of deal with, with um, um, Leviathan who's going to appear and be kind of a bitch because she is and you have to um, try to stop it which it's sort of a, a very interesting sequence and this is where you get your first taste of, oh my god, Noctis is bloody powerful. He's not just sort of powerful, he is bloody powerful. He is nigh on a god. At, during, ch this is chapter 9, during chapter 9, you fight Leviathan. And to start with... You can't do crap against Leviathan. You're dealing no damage. You can't do anything. I mean, technically, you should be able to if you've grinded enough. You should be dealing damage, but it won't let you. It probably won't even. It just that because it'll swap out what Leviathan you're fighting later, and then you become a flying, teleporting, mega. Like, you, you're wielding all the royal arms at once. You're permanently an armor gear. Flying, teleporting god. Just launching barrages of weapons at the enemy. At Leviathan. And it's a very cinematic fight. It's amazing. Not difficult. Most of the game isn't difficult. To be honest. But this is an amazing fight. And then... Shit goes wrong. And everything seems to fall apart. You've beaten Leviathan, but... Well, Luna's dead. I don't know if I should... I'm, I'm just talking about the whole game now. I don't know if I really want to do that, though. Uh... I feel like I'm getting into the territory where I'm just spouting the story. I'm just telling it. So, and that's basically... Okay, okay. Actually, Luna dying is probably the most important point in the story. Because that's why you're going straight to the in to the heart of the enemy. Not And Noctis is kind of a mess at this point. 
he's found out that Luna's died. Ignis is blind. He's awesome blind, but... Well, he's not awesome blind to start with. He's kind of slow and unhelpful blind to start with, but then he becomes awesome blind. Um, and so you set off on your way to get the last of the royal arms and to take out the Empire. And this is when Arden, the villain, the Chancellor of the Empire, starts to show up more and more and be more of an actual antagonist than, uh, you know, I'm sort of helping you guy. He's very antagonistic. He's trying to cause you trouble. He's attacking the train that you're on. He's um, manipulating your perspective. He's um, messing with... He separates you from Prompto and causes you to, well, feel guilty. He reveals that he's immortal when Shiva tries to kill him. Well, Shiva isn't trying to kill him. She's just basically buying you time. Because you find out that Shiva has actually been closer than you think this whole time. You can only summon Carbuncle on easy, which is sad. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Don't worry about Carbuncle. Carbuncle's fine on easy. Leave him there. So, you meet Shiva on the train. And then you get to Tenebrae, which is where Luna's from. I mean, somewhere along this line, you've gained resolve, and you're like, I'm going to fight. Actually, Tenebrae is before Shiva, so that's that's not too important. Um, anyway, you, you get to Tenebrae, you find out that um, there's a whole different thing going on than you thought it was. Um, you meet a character there who's, you know helping with evacuation and all sorts of stuff, helping keep things together in this... You realize at about that point that the Empire is completely falling apart. They have this really strong military, but everything else seems to be in total disarray. And then you start to get closer to the capital, which is when you start to realize there aren't any people. There's no people there. There's demons, but there's no people. And it's frozen over. So, what are we learning? We're learning that something's very, very wrong with the Empire. Then you get separated from Gladio and Ignis. You, That's when Arden gets to be very amazing as a villain because that's when he starts taunting you he that's when he starts talking to you over the speakers in this um facility that you're in that in basically their mega fortress that they have there so you've gone into this you you're in the city um i don't think in the city he talks to you but you're in the city but you've lost your powers and all you your only option is um, the Ring of Lucius, which you've only which you got from Luna, but Noctis wasn't willing to put it on. He was afraid for one reason or another. He felt guilty and stuff. Having no choice, he puts it on, and this is when you gain three new spells. You can't use any other magic. You can't use anything to start with except these three spells, and they are Death, Holy and a sort of black hole spell that consumes a bunch of enemies at once. Now, death is basically... You aim it, you choose your target, you use, you press your attack button, and over time, and you send... You draw basically energy from them into the ring, and that will eventually make them crumple in on themselves and collapse into nothing. Okay, that's kind of helpful. Ooh. And deals with a lot of weak enemy encounters that you have. Then there's Holy. Holy works on the basis of... It's a counter. 
you hold your uh, your phase button, and at the right moment when the enemy attacks while you're holding it, you'll counter with the holy spell, which deals a fair bit of damage. Not the most, but a fair bit. Um, and that's and these kind these all burn MP using them. So it's like, oh, finally another use for my MP. Except you start to realize that they're not that great spells, and the big one consumes all your MP. It, drags in a bunch of enemies but doesn't always kill them which is kind of sad you sort of shatter reality when you do that and it's kind of cool looking but the impact isn't that big so it's not that cool it's weakened by that effect so now you're in this facility now then you get into this facility where you have to navigate and you're trying to f and you're being taunted a bunch and you find out f you've earlier found out that prompto is here so you're both going to rescue prompto and get revenge get the crystal back all that jazz so you're sent on a whole chase hunting down and trying to find prompto and um the whole time arden is being an utter dick he is annoying as all hell, and you just want to strangle the bastard. And you really like him less and less, and it makes it actually makes him a more high quality villain because he's taunting you. He's there. He's you get to know him better, and you learn a lot about him in this time. He's been around a long time he's immortal he can't die and all this other stuff and he's and as you explore this facility you start to discover what's been going on in the empire a while ago they started developing a new type of soldier the magitech trooper but what a magitech trooper is a clones infected with a demon virus which is where demons come from. They're a viral infection, apparently. Or a pathogen. Something like that. They're in, they're infected, and they lose all their humanity. They become raging monsters. And you learn that not only is there these controlled experiments, not only is there this controlled experiment where they're creating clones, which they're using to make the Magitech Troopers because they're especially vulnerable to this virus but or disease or whatever it is the infection but the infection got out into the city and no one noticed that the infection was creating demons for a while however by the time they noticed it was already too late it was an epidemic and every human in Nephilim had become a demon so this entire empire, basically at the start of the game, was already finished. They were already dying out. There were very few humans left. It was mostly just demons. And when you get there, there's not a single human left. Even the emperor of Nephilim is a demon. He's a nuisance because, well, I forgot, I didn't get a powerful enough spell to take him out in one shot. But even if I had, he'd just respawn. Uh, he's, a, he's a nuisance and, he, and you got to kill him. you got to fight him. you, you got to, like, survive against him, then fight him later. Because, you know, story insists that you do things this way. Anyway, um, at a certain point when you get in there, you acquire Noctis's father's sword, which is the last royal arm and you became able to use two things now the ring and the sword the ring which uses MP and the sword which uses HP but that's fine because most enemies you'll take them out before you run out of HP and so you're using the sword and you fight your way through a bunch of stuff um, you reunite with everyone and then you have to go your separate ways because you're the only one that can warp which I'd kind of like to be able to share that ability with um 
Prompto, Gladio, and Ignis at this point, but you can't. So since you're the only one that can warp, you're the only one that can get to where you need to go. Well, actually that's not true because they could have all just gone on the elevator, but hey. And you need to go um, get the crystal. Which you do. But that was a trap. Because Arden, what he wanted wasn't just to beat you. He could have beaten you long ago. He's more than powerful enough. He could have just waltzed into insomnia and killed everyone himself. He really could have. He could have killed you ages ago so easily. You see, he wanted something specific. He wanted to destroy, utterly destroy you. Let you rise as high as you could and then make you fall. So... He essentially wants you to gain, like, the full power of the king of, um, Lucius. Absolute power of light. And he lets you gain it. He lets you get to the crystal, he lets you get power from the crystal, but you fall into a ten-year coma. You wake up, it's completely night, all the time, everywhere... And everything sucks. Everyone's become strong, and but they're having a difficult time. Everyone, uh, most people are living in this one city, so you know humanity's actually fucked because repopulation's impossible at this point. Um, but let's let it go because it's a fantasy world, and everything is completely screwed. So what do we do? Well, we start walking. We take a well, we take a boat because we're on an island out to sea, and then we start walking. And you don't know how long it's been yet. You don't know how long it's been. So you start walking, you start running, and there's demons everywhere. It's a pain in the ass to deal with them. You don't you don't want to have to walk the entire way up to Hammerhead because. You've been listening to note that it says to meet at Hammerhead. So you got to walk all the way to Hammerhead? That's a nightmare. That's a long walk. But you walk that way anyway. Until you get to a point where a truck shows up. And in this truck there's this guy. And he introduces himself and you realize that he's one of the, he's this kid that you met earlier in the game. It's like, holy shit, he's grown up. How long has it been? Ten years? Wow. Wow, that's a long time for everything to go to fuck. And then you set off to Hammerhead. You get there, you can do some last minute preparations, item buying, stuff like that. And then you do, you head into Insomnia for the first time. And that's where everything shows up. No, actually, this is where you get back to the very start. At the very start of the game, there's a scene with some sort of fire demon sitting on a chair. You learn that this is Ifrit. And he's of a different mind of all the other gods, apparently, which is very strange because it's Ifrit, who, seen, who gets along with humans very well considered in, in all the other Final Fantasy games. He's like, yeah, I'll help you out. I'll help you out. Show me you're strong. I'll help you out. Oh, you're tough? Okay, I'll help you out. That's basically Ifrit. In every other Final Fantasy game. He's like, you showed me strength, you're you're not a you're not a jackass, I'll help you out. Um along the way you've also met Bahamut who you'll only see once. Well, you'll only summon once. And so you get into insomnia, you fight your way, you get to the um you're trying to get to the Citadel. You have to go on the ground. You get to the Citadel. You fight Ifrit. You, you're back where you started in, in the game. And you take out Ifrit. It's not that tough. It's a it's a fairly good boss fight. And then eventually you proceed. And you fight Arden one on one. Very cinematic fight. But it's you can basically do it. And all you've got to and you can basically take them very hit on. It's not a tough fight. The ground fight is the most 
interesting in terms of a fight part. He's got all sorts of abilities. You've got all sorts of abilities. Um, use them. And once you get him down like 25% HP, that's when the real, I put air quotes there, fight begins, which is the cinematic fight. Which is where you go back into that godlike state that you fought um, Leviathan in. And for the most part, it's your zoo. The two of you are both in this state, and you're zooming all over the place, fighting, clashing. And in all honesty, it's not like you're going to have that much difficulty. At the most, you're going to have to use a potion or two. Well, some high potions. One, I think I used one high potion in that fight, and it was easy. Easy. Then again, if you haven't leveled up much, it might be tougher, but you probably have. So, you get into this fight. And the thing is, you know you're going to die. To kill him and restore the light to the world, you have to die. And you've come, and Noctis has come to terms with that. One of the last things he does before he goes to the fight is he asks to see all the pictures that Prompto has taken. And he chooses one. And there is there's actually a natural choice a very natural choice for what he wants to take with him to die with and like you can take any picture you want but personally I chose um, there's a photo of like basically all the good guys and you take he takes this picture with him and it has a like minor significance on the ending but it's a very sentimental significance so you fight Arden and you eventually destroy him physically. But then you need to absorb you need to get rid of the darkness. So you absorb you go to the throne, and you absorb all the light of the crystal and the kings into the ring of Lucius. And then you go to confront um Arden in the spiritual world. And you see, Luna Freya tried to cure him. Like, she placed a cure sort of spell on his arm. But what that did was it um, sort of weakened his demonic energies there. Because Arden is effectively just a whole mass of demons. So then you're thrown into this one button press sequence where you all you have to do is press O. And he tries to stop you, but what Luna did prevents that from happening. So you get to annihilate him. You annihilate him and it's over. You're dead. And it's the light's restored. You don't really get much of a prologue. It's the it settles on this ending of it shows the throne room and it shows Noctis and Luna together but you know they're dead. This is them together in the afterlife. And Yeah. That's how it ends and it's like that was cool. I'm glad they stuck to it. I'm glad they stuck to. I'm gonna. We're gonna kill this character off, and we're gonna kill the main character off. But we we're sticking to it, and we're sticking to our guns. We're not going to cheap out, and bring the characters back. It's kind of like how the good ending in Final Fantasy Type Zero sucks. The ending sucks, but it's good. The ending is quality, but you know, I hate it. But I, but it's a view. When I say I hate it, like I emotionally hate it. I emotionally hate the fact that Luna d has to, had to die, that Noctis had to die. That I don't like the fact that they died, but that makes it good. That make not good, but compelling. That's the word. 
That's the thing about it. That's why Eris dying matters so much. It's compelling that she dies. That's why it's the same here, because Luna dying matters. It's compelling. Noctis dying matters. It's compelling. That he had to make this choice, this live in darkness forever, or just let everyone else live in light. And that's that. I mean, it's kind of vague at the end, because technically that could be perceived as, hey, they came back to life. But no, that's not how it works. But that's not what I intended at all. Um, once And once that's done, you can do the New Game Plus stuff. Well, New Game Plus and... If, I think it's those 1.0 free patch. That's New Game Plus. Yeah. That allows you New Game Plus, but you can do the post-game stuff. And my voice is getting kind of raw here. Wow. I've been talking for over an hour and a half. So I'm, I'm going to call this a review. If I ever post it. Yeah. Um, so then you get the, you get the post game stuff where you fight a giant turret or you unlock these secret vaults that are in a bunch of the dungeons with his special big bosses at the end of them and you can get the ultimate weapons um, clean up any side quests you hadn't done you can finish off hunts all the hunts and stuff and you can l finish up your um, skills like finally get level 10 fishing and cooking and survival because that because your photography is going to be at level 10 this first unless you do a shit ton of fishing and make that your focus you know, probably can only take so many photos a day hmm. anyway um I know that there is a final dungeon in the game, and that is supposedly the hardest dungeon in the game. It's apparently like a lot harder than the rest of the game, which is cool. Which is cool. And I'd like to take that on at some point, but generally speaking, Final Fantasy XV is a very enjoyable game. It's not hard enough to be intimidating it's not so easy all the time though that you can just be like la di da di da I'll take it all on I'll just win easy I'll do everything easy 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 peasy easy peasy easy it's not that easy but it's not particularly hard either um, taking on um, Castle Mark Tower too early which is level 55 dungeon will strain your resources it'll cost you a lot of money you're gonna need to stock up a magic you may need to make make multiple trips in and out of the dungeon I sure did because I wouldn't be able to do it without like building up magic again because I could not beat a whole bunch of the enemies without like using really powerful quadra casts or spells That being said, you can beat it at a low level. It's expensive at that level, and difficult, but you can do it. Um, it's got a pretty good combat system that's got a few flaws. The Ascension... Okay, that's one thing I haven't talked about. Ascension's, like, divided into a whole bunch of categories that are, like, um... Gr that are... Bun that are... Bunch of nodes that you upgrade. And some of it's like, there's a stats, there's an exploration that gets you more AP, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's like, oh yeah, this gives me bonuses, this gives me bonuses, stuff like that, yep, that's cool, I want that, etc, etc, okay, that's an upgrade that I want, etc, I'm just talking nonsense now, um, there's all that stuff. It's really cool. Uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say something, but I don't know what it is. Um, Ascension, yeah. 
like here's the thing you can actually learn new combat skills techniques that's where you learn your extra techniques um except a few um that's where um you learn stuff that makes your characters last longer um things that make magic easier to use and stuff like that that's what ascension's all for also allows you to upgrade the armor gear as you um as it gets better Oh yeah, and the armor gear chain, which is a chain move that you can activate during armor gear that uses up the last of it, that combines your attack with your party member's attack and does a whole bunch of damage. That that's not really what I. That's just one last thing about the combat. That's an extra thing. Um. All things considered, when you are done. All said and done, it's a pretty, it's a fun experience. It's a enjoyable road trip adventure that's got a really dark end to it. That the end is really somber and dark and heavy, and then you end on a very sad note, but a very sad, hopeful note. That's what it ends on. A sad but hopeful note. Hmm. And that's been my review of Final Fantasy XV. Amazing dungeons. Awesome overworld with. N sat the this is the one thing I'll say about it. The overworld lacks something to make it memorable. But it almost has it and this is ac actually I'm going to bring up a comparison that I've been thinking up a lot in my head because I remember I can remember I remember this the world of um, Final Fantasy 15 by dividing it up into mostly four sections you got the right which is the desert you got the swamp plainsy area you got the plains on the um, west, and you get the northern lake. That's the main divide of the main overworld map. And there's a few distinguishing features here. Like there's this massive mountain that you find out later is a turtle. That's cool. That's memorable. There's this big lake swampy lake where the Caltropos all stand around and that's cool there's these big arcs that you remember yeah that's cool there's this mountainside city which is cool and these are the memorable parts there's also a bunch of really not all that memorable stuff there's also one of the other memorable things is the great ravine that has um, rock formations crisscrossing across it, which that's memorable, but you never actually go in there, so it's kind of disappointing. Even when you get the flying car. Then there's the flaming vo volcano and the ice cave. The flaming volcano is memorable because you can see it. The ice cave, yeah, you go there once. Well, twice maybe, but once. You go there once. It's not all that interesting. Um, you can... There's a few things to remember, but most of them, it's not really all that mem Most of it's not all that memorable. And, well... Oh, well. Too bad. If it's not that memorable, it's not that memorable. Like, there's a whole... There's all this stuff, and it's not that memorable. Like, I'm remembering a bunch of it now, but I'm pretty fresh off playing it. And here's the thing. I began comparing this game a lot in my head to Xenoblade Chronicles Cross. And in a lot of ways, in some ways, it's better. But in the amount of freedom you have to explore and go around this world, it is pitifully restrictive in comparison. Anywhere in the terrain in Xenoblade Chronicles Cross, you can go. The restriction of the world in Xenoblade Chronicles Cross 
is empty water. I mean, at the corners of the map, there are actually small islands of hidden secrets that are kind of cool. But otherwise, it's just empty water in that game. Is the limit. So, you know, um, King, uh, Final Fantasy XV, unfortunately, has all these invisible walls and stuff which you can't climb over if you're you can't jump smartly over them you can't but the game and the game wasn't designed was designed to have these limitations in place except you could have had an uncrossable, uncrossable mountain that you can't cross on foot but what but what disappoints me the most is I can't go to I can't just fly at the end of the game you get the airship but I can't just fly to everywhere I want to go. I can't fly back to the continent that Niflheim's on. I could also Im almost imagine you actually doing that. And that's probably the most disappointing thing. Probably the most disappointing thing is the lack of freedom that you've got. The All these restrictions. These barriers that they have to set up that are and the thing is a bunch of them feel unnatural like why is this fence here this fence doesn't actually have a reason for being here and it's like oh yeah we gotta stop the players from going there somehow oh, because we never actually found it I don't know if it was they never actually found a use for the area there that they made or what not but hey there's a bunch of but the worst ones are, hey, I could, it looks like I can jump up here. No, nah, no, nah, no, nah, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Not for Chocobo either? No, nah, not for Chocobo. And that's where it gets really disappointing. But anyway. Pretty awesome game. Some flaws, and I can't help but think, I wish this had the amount of freedom that um, Xenoblade Chronicles Cross had. Not necessarily the same content, but freedom was something that I constantly compared it to. And the running. The running was slow in comparison to Xenoblade Chronicles Cross, but you run about as fast as a chocobo in that game. Fun fact, I measured how fast I could get my chocobo to run. And my estimate is they're, getting, they're close to... Um, running at a hundred feet per second which when you do if we if the actual speed at 100 feet a second is in kilometers per hour is roughly 110 kilometers an hour that's a little bit it's actually 109 point something but that's beside the point that's around where we are but in terms of miles per hour that's about 67.5 miles per hour is what I got like that's 100 that's what 108 kilometers an hour is so it's somewhere around 170 67 to 68 miles per hour that's how fast a chocobo is running at full speed in that game so how so the car and the car is obviously going faster than that because well it's covering the distance quicker but that's only because the distance is kind of inaccurate and we have to consider that this game is actually inaccurate in terms of distance and stuff like that but yeah it feel it, the chocobo might be running slower than that but it's it can run bloody fast that's just the last thing I want to go out on. Anyway, I enjoyed this game a lot, so hope you enjoyed. I don't give out scores, because that's silly.